Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kiri Burkett and I'm a coordinator for the network of the National Library of Medicine, Southeastern Atlantic Region. Uh, before I turn things over to our presenter, I have just a few logistical notes. Uh, first, there is closed captioning available for this webinar and I'm going to share the link for that in the chat box right now. And I'll share that a few more times as people continue to come in and we get underway. chat box is not cooperating with me, of course. There we go. This is a large group, so everyone will remain muted throughout the presentation. However, if you'd like to share thoughts or questions with us or your colleagues, please do type them into the chat box and make sure that you've selected all participants from the drop-down menu uh, so that we and your colleagues can see your thoughts. As I mentioned briefly, this uh, presentation is being recorded and it will be posted to the NNLM YouTube channel. Uh, but that being said, the chat box and the participants list will not be included in the recording. So that information will stay within this audience. Now I am pleased to introduce today's guest, Jody Ann Beery. Jody Ann has a mission to disrupt business as usual to achieve social change. She is a speaker, writer, and equity advocate. Her work is grounded in centering the experiences of historically underrepresented communities and the systemic intersectional approaches needed to address inequities. Jody Ann holds a master's in public health from the University of Michigan. She prides herself on being a cool auntie, a twist out queen, cancer survivor, adventurer, and reluctant dog owner. Jody Ann is currently working on her first book and podcast called Black Cancer, which explores stories about women of color and healthcare. Thank you, Jody Ann, so much for being here, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much. I'm literally just sitting here. I'm like, of course, you know, you go through your whole presentation and you're looking for all these little details here and there. And you're just like, I don't want any typos. And then boom, there's a typo in the title slide. And so I apologize for that. It was a last minute um, stylistic thing that I did in the cover and I just didn't catch that I made that change. Anyway, hi everyone, this is Jody Ann. Um, my title of the presentation today, sans the typo, is because I see what you do, how microaggressions undermine hope for authenticity at work. And I think, you know, that is the perfect lead into how I want to ground this next section as we center on what's going on in our society right now. Um, I understand that this talk will be available uh, publicly for a couple of months, I think a year. And so my hope is that a year from now, this whole section will just be a distant memory, but I do want to ground us in where we are right now. I call this the inside times. We are in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that has completely shifted life around the world and particularly here in the United States. Most of us are working from home or working um, somewhat cautiously as we try to engage in a way that can reduce transmission of the coronavirus. It's been a scary time. It's been a devastating time for those who have lost people in their families, their loved ones, in their lives. Um, we're in an unprecedented situation, which is the understatement of the century. And so understanding the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in, and then this other pandemic where we are in a serious reckoning around systemic racism in the United States and what it means to say that Black Lives Matter. I was in a conversation with someone the other day, and even the affirmation that can come from Black Lives Matter is this simultaneous sense that because I have to say it means that in a lot of parts of our society, that's not true. And so we are in a racial reckoning in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, so many people who have lost their lives so many people who have been the victims of senseless, senseless violence, thinking of Jacob Blake here. 
thinking about the anti-Asian racism that had this resurgence when COVID-19 first hit, thinking about what's happening at the border and how we're valuing the lives of folks who are not, you know, quote, unquote, from here. You know, we are in a crisis where our very notion of what is normal is being challenged in really serious ways. And it's up to us to decide who we want to be on the other side of this dimension, of this portal that has opened up um, in the wake of all this unrest, all this uncertainty. Also want to acknowledge that, you know, I have my windows open because it's just so hot and I, they really shouldn't be open because all across the Western coast, fires are raging and people are being impacted by losing their homes losing whole ecosystems in their areas, you know, being uh, subjected to really, really poor air quality. I understand that there's a hurricane that's happening on the southeast side of the country right now. Um, there are a lot of people who are suffering in a lot of ways, and the fact that y'all are here today to figure out how to be hopeful in some way and the work that it takes to be hopeful um, says a lot about where we can go and where we can be. And so it's in the context of that where I'm just like, yeah, I had a typo. It's the inside times. Racism is real and ravaging. It's a really stressful period. And so I'm going to forgive myself and I hope you all can forgive me. And so who am I? As Carrie said, my name is Jody Ann. I'm a speaker. I'm a writer. I'm a disruptor. And I think a lot of times you'll hear um, folks open a talk and they give some long title of who they are and where they work and what position they hold. I don't have that. I'm an entrepreneur now because like 50 million people and counting in the wake of COVID-19, I lost my job. And it's in that context where I said, okay, what can I do? How can I support my community? How can I still share my ideas and my work around diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusive workplaces, having places of belonging, and having actually real conversations about intersectionality and racism, what can I do? And so what I did was fired up the computer, you know, created some events, and really started engaging with folks all over the country, all over the world on these topics, and it's a privilege to be in service of that work. I always start every single talk with a quotation from Dr. Maya Angelou, who has been a huge part of my own intellectual and personal development. And of the many, many, many quotations that she has, I feel like this one doesn't get quoted nearly as much, but she says, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive. And to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor and some style. And so that is the approach that I want to bring to our conversation today. And even though our chat won't be present in the YouTube public version of this, I really want that energy to be alive in our conversation today, in our community space today in the chat. How can we bring some compassion, some passion to this work, some humor, and some style? I want to see y'all style today. And so what are today's norms? Let's just set some baselines, because often when we get into conversations like these, people aren't totally sure of how to engage. And as a way to unlock participation, as a way to get people comfortable with what's going to happen today, let's set some norms. I think we've talked extensively about practicing empathy, understanding the moment that we're in. Um, Understanding where you are. You're in my apartment right now. I have a studio apartment in Seattle, Washington. This is where you are with me in my home. I have a dog that is walking around. He just ate, and so he's, you know, getting ready to go. And I'm sure y'all have your dogs, your pets, your partners, your children, your roommates. You know, I'm sure there are many distractions outside of your window like I do. I have birds chirping. Like, there's just so much going on. Practice empathy with where we are in this moment and practice empathy with what might happen today. I have no idea what's going to happen with the technology and the microphone and the lighting and all of this. There's a lot happening and I want you to feel comfortable. As even in all of this, I'm hoping to feel comfortable with you all. If you have to bring your iPad or computer or phone with you, 
on a on to the couch or to grab some tea, you know, do that. Let's be in community together. Also thinking about resisting defensiveness. There might be some things that we talk about today that might be uncomfortable. There might be stuff in the chat that folks share that, you know, make you feel a little defensive. Let's resist that. Let's think of the things that make us uncomfortable as ways where we can learn. Open up another tab on your screen. I'm old school, so I always have post-it notes and notepads around me. Take some notes yourself. Write it in the chat. How do we become a space where things that make us uncomfortable actually becomes our map for learning? This is separate from, you know, I don't believe there are both sides, you know. I do think that there are some ways that we communicate that can be really harmful and toxic. And so let's separate things that make you uncomfortable between things that are like, toxic and problematic. And so things that make you uncomfortable, that's a space to learn. If there are ways that people might be inviting harm into this conversation, um, and harm can look like negating people's own experiences, that's really not what we want to see in the chat. Uh, we are in a collective learning and collective teaching environment. And so, like Carrie said, we have a lot of folks in the room today. And so you all won't be able to engage with me in the same way, but I still see it as a conversation. I'm looking at the chat. I'm seeing ways that you want to talk to me and speak with each other. How can what I'm saying reflect back to you ways that you can grow your learning? But there are ways, there, I'm sure there's so many people in the room who know way more about this than I do. Bring some of your insights into the chat. What I also love to see is when people put links, if I'm talking about a quotation or an individual or an idea and you have a, a sense of a podcast or an article, sharing those resources in the chat. We're all in here learning together. I connect with your own experiences. Like I said, we're in a, a space where, you know, I won't be able to hear from you, but if there's something I'm talking about that reminds you of something that you did or, or something that you've experienced, you know, find ways to, to share that in the chat or take note of that, you know, actual notes that you're taking in, on your computer or on pieces of paper, but or also in your own mind. Ground the examples that I'm using from my own life with thinking about things that have happened in your life. And then again, in relation to sitting with defensiveness, there's not really a lot here to necessarily disagree with. We're just sitting in facts and experiences. And so how can we grow our learning and our understanding and add a little bit more nuances versus this is right, this is wrong? Just go deeper into the work and asking more questions. And so all of that I would love to see reflected in the chat. From even our introduction, I know that folks are coming in from all over the place. And so I love that. And so thank you, Gail. You know, thank you, Christine. I love what's happening in the chat and I really want to see people engaging and sharing. Oops, looking the wrong screen. Okay, so here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to set some foundations, and then I want to set a vision for authenticity at work. And there are a lot of barriers to, have to achieving that vision. What is that authentic workplace? And then what are some solutions for that? That'll be our outline today. Four quick sections over the next 50 or so, 40 minutes that we have together. So let's begin with setting some foundations. Grounding in this particular talk, let us ground ourselves in James Baldwin's words here. That is the foundation of the title of this piece. You know, he says, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. I see what you do. And so what I want to do today, what I'm excited to do today is to move us from our ideas, from our values, from the ways that we might defend ourselves um, to the things that we've read about, right? All of these more kind of things that we say, things that we believe, and a lot of times maybe things that we don't say. 
how can we turn that into action? Because I see what you do. And what I'm trying to ground us in this mindset today is I don't know how important it is what you say or what you believe or even apologies for things, right? Even what you say in terms of an apology, what can you do? What can you do now? What can you do in the future? And I wanted to use his words in the framing of this conversation because when we often talk about microaggressions, when we talk about the vision for authentic workplaces, we focus so much on our words and these values, but we're not fully showing what we actually are doing. And so let's keep that mindset today as we have our conversation. And so let's go through some key concepts. I like to start everything with making sure everyone's level set with what these definitions mean and specifically what they mean to me. And so you have a sense of the framework that I'm using as we enter into this discussion and we build on these concepts. So some key concepts here, diversity. Diversity refers to the demographic mix of things, right? In this case, we're talking about people. What I often find with companies and organizations is that we use diverse or diversity as a proxy for demographic identities that we feel uncomfortable saying. We might feel uncomfortable saying, you know, we need to hire more black people or, you know, there aren't enough women in this room. And I do think that our society has reached a place where we can talk a little better about gender than we have in the past, but way better than we can talk about race. And so people might say, oh, Jodi Ann, you know, you're a diverse speaker. You know, we're having a diverse speaker talk today. No, Jodi Ann is not diverse. Jodi Ann's one person. <laughs> and so maybe Jodi Ann diversifies a, a speaker lineup in some way. We are talking about a mix of people, but let's be conscious of the ways that we're using diversity as a proxy. So when we start using proxy, that means that we're not actually talking about the thing that we're trying to talk about, which means we can't create solutions for the thing that we're actually talking about because we can't even name it. How can we start naming race and racism? And so diversity speaks to who is in the room, right? This metaphorical room. Inclusion. It's who's at the table, who makes decisions, who's in leadership. And what you might find at a lot of companies is that you might have a lot of people of color, right? But are they pooling at the lower paid levels of the company? Or are they distributed evenly across not just salaries, which also sometimes align with how you make decisions, who gets to make decisions for the company, for your organization, for the initiative, for the team? And so who's at the table? Who are we including in being able to make decisions for our group? Equity is who gets to be heard. And this has happened way too often in my career, and I want to see in the chat, and as you think about your own experiences, has this happened to you? Particularly for folks of color in this room, folks who have some other identity that's been marginalized in our society by gender, by sexual identity, um, by sexual orientation, by ability status, what have you. Have you been in the room, right? You've been at the table and you're like raising your hand, trying to be heard and nobody wants to hear what you have to say. Or you say something and no one seems to respond. Or you say something and it gets automatically negated, right? Who gets to be heard? How do we account for the fact that if you have a room of 20 white people, having one or two white people for diversity, have one or two black people for diversity is not proportional in terms of their ability to have maybe some impact in that space, right? Are we tokenizing people or are they equitably participating? Do we have space for that? And so, Thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I look at as kind of like a before times idea, right? Several months ago, six months ago, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I felt was very on, on brand with the time. 
now, this moment that we're in right now, September 2020, it feels already a little outdated. I don't know if y'all have felt this as well, because in the wake of George, uh, George Floyd's murder and this resurgence of this racial reckoning around systemic racism in the United States and the amount of companies and organizations and high profile individuals that are really championing um, what it looks like institutionally to stand in solidarity with black lives with the ways that young people and folks all across across the country, across the world, were taken to the streets in solidarity with Black Lives and really, really leading this movement. To talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion with that backdrop already feels a little stale. And so I felt like we went from, we're going to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative until overnight, it was like, we're going to eradicate white supremacy in all aspects of our society, right? We're in a new dimension right now. And so now people are talking about racial equity, about racism, about being anti-racist, right? We've elevated the conversation really, really quickly. And so racial equity, it's a state of being in our society where race is a non-predictive aspect of your outcome. Race cannot predict your outcome. And so think about your organizations. Back in the day when we walked into rooms, you know, if you walked into a room and you saw a black woman sitting there and a meeting's about to start, you know, people are trickling in. Do you think she's the intern or do you think she's the CEO? When we have organizations where being a person of color starts to align with holding less positions of power within a company, then we start mapping on someone's race to what their outcomes are in our organization. We see that in the health field. We know that black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbearing. Being a black woman of reproductive age, that concerns me. That I know that if I walk into a doctor's office and I'm trying to you know, manage my health care, manage my birth plan, that I probably might statistically have a poor outcome, just a factor of my blackness. We know that Latinx women get 53 cents on the dollar for what, what white men make. By the nature of being a woman, being a woman of color, being a Latinx woman specifically, you will get what's pay. So currently we are in a racially inequitable society and everything we do should be driving towards racial equity. And so as we think about getting towards racial equity, then we think about our behaviors and ideas that might be taking us away from racial equity. That's racist, right? And that is the inertia of our society. And so to be anti-racist is to insert these very specific intentional behaviors and ideas that get us towards equity. You know, and thank you to Dr. Ingram X. Kendi for putting this language around anti-racist into our public discourse. What are the things that you're intentionally doing to drive us towards racial equity? Because racial equity is not, um, not guaranteed. It's going to take action to get there. And so as we think about these concepts, let's think about this vision. If we have this vision for racial equity, let's think about, you know, this vision for authenticity in the workplace, how people can fully be themselves, where we don't have these predictive elements of our race in terms of how we can show up at work. So first, let's look at what work looks like, right? And as I share this story, I want you to think, what are the ways that you you specifically, as an individual, stifle the participation and the career progression of your colleagues of color. And so, you know, a while back, I was in a brainstorming meeting. I was part of a leadership team at my job, and we're having really dynamic conversations. Everyone's asking questions. Everyone's putting input, and we're driving this project. I think we ended in a really great place than when we started. After the meeting, uh, my supervisor pulled me aside and she asked to meet with me, which as a woman in the workplace, 
having your supervisor unexpectedly want to speak with you after a meeting, at least for me, and I'm curious what people experience in the chat, 10 times out of 10, that meeting's not gonna go well, right? And so I was meeting with her and what she said to me, like literally still scarred me. After the meeting, she asked, you know, how I thought the meeting went, which I already thought was a setup. And then she tells me that in future meetings, that in, in when we have our leadership discussions, I should be more agreeable and I should not ask as many questions during the meeting. And actually, in fact, if I have any feedback or questions, I should just put that in an email and send it to whoever hosted the meeting and not really talking about it in the meeting. And so when I confronted her about, you know, how her feedback was landing on me and, you know, informed her that this is very typical for how women of color, black women specifically, are treated in the workplace. The way she responded, and I'll get more into that later, was to completely discount my experience. She told me that I shouldn't play the race part the race card in 2020, we're still having these conversations. And so how in that situation where I'm trying to be heard, I'm at the table, I'm in the room, and I'm being intentionally told to be quiet, not to say anything in the meeting, send feedback later. How does somebody grow their profession that way? How are you stifling? your parts, your the ability for your colleagues of color to participate, to grow, to engage, to be seen as passionate. Think about what you're doing to uphold that as a norm. And that was my experience, but here's a couple of other experiences. Here's what work can look like for black people. A couple of stories at the top. These are the stories that people have shared with me. And so one person says, I was isolated, bullied, humiliated at work for two years. I went out to my line manager, ignored me for months. I was diagnosed with work-related anxiety, and it was only when my psychologist wrote a threatening letter to my employer that I was heard. Thinking about the health impact of a lot of these work experiences, the stressful work experience. Another story, although I'm an expert in my area at work and manage all of the processes related to my office, people continue to seek confirmation about my work from white women where I work. That discounting of your contributions. I've heard a couple of these in this third column. Did you stick your finger in a socket this morning? Or, oh, you look better with your hair straight like that. So many comments about hair are the second identifier for racial difference. Here's the last one I'll share. Recognizing inclusion efforts in the workplace by leadership as grassroots efforts. It's placed a large burden on women and people of color at work without leadership support while suppressing offensive call out. And this speaks to this current moment where a lot of companies and organizations are trying to find solves for racism in their work environment. And so then they ask all the people of color to deal with it. And it's a grassroots thing and not a leadership initiative. And then when you try to call things out, they tell you you're, you're being offensive or they're trying to suppress your, your assessment of the situation. So then what am I trying to do? You know, if I'm trying to fix it, you tell me that I don't even have your support. And so I see, see a lot of affirmation in the chat for people like, yep, that was me, that was me, that was me. And that's so sad that this is what work can look like. And so I want to give folks a couple of moments to continue to share in the chat about what work has looked like for you as a person of color, um, how it's been hard, how it's been difficult, Maybe some solutions that you've tried, um, maybe some solutions that have failed. You know, let's just share a little bit with each other in this community space.
Thank you, Ella. It is, it is very tiring, right? It is so tiring. It's exhausting to experience all, in all dimensions of our work life, people talking about our hair, people prioritizing their own desires to tell us that our hair is beautiful or prioritizing their own interests and not paying attention to the fact that a lot of this is really hurtful. And in my work, I've seen this across industry, across levels of seniority, across the country, across the world, women of color, folks of color, people who any type of marginalization are experiencing these microaggressions on all fronts. And so if this is our state, let's be in this vision for authenticity, right? There's a lot that's currently happening. And so what, what do you even want, right? Why can't I just talk about your hair? No, you can't talk about our hair, right? You know, can we think about our differences and the way we show up as assets and not liabilities? Can, are we allowed to be transparent? Just imagine if, if black folks, folks of color, people have any type of marginalization can just be transparent with who they are instead of being asked to assimilate. Can we be rewarded for our differences and not being punished or being rewarded for speaking up about discrimination and not punished for it? Can we be treated as partners in this work, in our company goals and these initiatives and not pets, not these tokens that we just have around but don't want to do anything? Can our differences be celebrated and not interrogated? And oftentimes, an interrogation can look like you just asking me something about my hair. Hair is the second racial identifier that we have. And so by your quote unquote compliment, right, that is a signifier that I'm different and just reminding me that I don't belong. That's how it can be received. So can we just be celebrated and just like say nothing, just allow me to be in that space? And can we both be supported in our careers and trying to push forward and trying to move initiatives around anti-racism forward and not be burdened in any way? I think about like what work can look like, assets, transparency, rewards, partners, celebration, support. I get excited about that. And so when we think about how we want to reimagine work, what is your vision for having an authentic workplace, a place of belonging? Let's see a little bit in the chat. What does an authentic workplace look like to you? Think about that, write it down, meditate on it. Think about not resisting. I, I see some resistance in these comments right now. Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? What is the vision, right? Having your workplace mirror your community. Thank you so much, Mary, for that. Just being able to do your work. I just wanna serve. I don't wanna have to deal with that. Let's have some transparency. Can I just live without needing to explain myself? creating a sense of community and accountability for people at all levels. I love this. Having a workplace that reflects the community demographic, having respect, no bad will for others. Love that. Where people can speak clearly, not passive aggressively. Thank you so much about who they are, what they want and people having space to be themselves, recognizing excellence, openness to learn, wanting everyone to succeed. Oh my gosh, I love this. Policies about microaggressions being acknowledged and established by HR. We don't want our coworkers who are people of color to be put on the spot to represent DEI. Having race, thank you, Claire, having racial equity at all levels of the organization. I love this. Like, 
I want people to spend time to think about what is your vision for an authentic workplace? What could that actually look like? Oftentimes you look at what's wrong, and I think that's important to be there, but let's also put that same work into what we want to build. So as we think about what we want to build, and y'all are giving some phenomenal examples here of what work can look like. What are some barriers to these goals? There's so many people here who have this vision for authentic workplace, but what are some of these barriers? Let's dig in a little bit more on that. So what the heck is a microaggression? I've been saying it a bunch. People have been mentioning it in the chat. A microaggression has actually been around for about 50 years. Dr. Chester Pierce originated it in the 70s. Dr. Sue has expanded the work. It's the everyday slights, indignities, the put downs, and the insults that people of color, women, LGBTQIA plus people, or those who have been marginalized, what they experience in their day to day interactions with people. Those are microaggressions. And what's difficult about microaggressions is that they can be really, really small actions. Asking me about my hair, touching my hair, telling me that my English is good, asking me where I'm really from, consistently leaving me off of meetings. These, it can be small things, but they have huge impact. For folks who have experienced microaggressions in the chat, you know, please share, think about what's the earliest microaggression you can think about that happened to you. I can think about things that happened to me in middle school. Middle school. And that has still stayed with me into adulthood. Right? So what are some examples of microaggressions? Having your, your work, thinking about your work contributions, having your judgment being questioned in your own area of expertise, needing to provide more evidence of your competence than other people do, and communication being addressed in a less than professional way. I had a professor share once that her black students and other students of color disproportionately addressed her as professor or doctor, but disproportionately her white students would speak to her with her first name without that signifier, right? Being addressed in a less than professional way being mistaken for someone at a much lower level than you. Like I said, you see a woman of color in a room, do you think she's the intern or the CEO? You see a woman of color in scrubs, do you think she's the nurse or do you think she's your surgeon? Are you surprised if you're in a situation where you walk into the room, the surgeon walks into the room and they're not a white dude, right? Um, hair touching, comments on hair, hearing demeaning remarks about you know, your community, overhearing jokes that are off color or racist or sexist or what have you, the denial of racism. I'm not racist. I don't see color. If you don't see race, then you can't solve for racism, right? And I love the examples that folks are bringing into the chat and also bringing into intersectional perspectives here. Thank you so much. And when we think about, you know, the experiences that we're having now, the experiences that we've had in the past, this can lead to racial battle fatigue. No, it's not my concept, I didn't come up with it, so Dr. Smith did. But racial battle fatigue, when you're dealing with these microaggressions and they compound over time, that stress has to go somewhere, right? That has to be expressed in some way. And so there's the psychological distress, right? Frustration, defensiveness, irritability, mood changes, anger, resentment. There's the physiological stress, you know, headaches, teeth grinding. How many teeth grinders do you have here? Chest pain, shortness of breath, muscle aches, high blood pressure. There are ways that stress shows up in our body. You know, there's emotional or behavioral stress, stereotype threat, having this high effort coping, you know, an increased commitment to maybe spirituality or different ways that we're trying to cope emotionally with the mental health stress of everything. Right, these things compound over time, and that's why something as small isn't really as small because it fits, fits into this larger space of your experience. And then a lot of times when you're trying to advocate for something, then people gaslight you, right? It's this form of psychological manipulation where you are questioning your own reality. 
And so when they had that confrontation with my supervisor, she did exactly this, this DARVO acronym, Deny, Attack, Reverse the Victim and Offender. Not my term, I think it's Dr. Jennifer or something, I forget her last name, but this is, I did not originate this. So deny, attack, and reverse the victim and offender. This is what this sounds like. When someone says, this has nothing to do with your race, you're being too sensitive, you don't understand. You know, Jody Ann, if you're gonna bring up race every time we, you know, have a feedback conversation, it's gonna make it really hard for us to work together. I'm just trying to help you. Thank you so much, Erin, about the Jennifer Freud. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you, right? I want you to be successful. I'm trying to help you here. And so this sense of like, you can walk away from that saying like, man, did I ask too many questions? Oh, is it more important that this person wants to talk to me about my hair than it is of the fact that this makes me really uncomfortable? And we normalize this in our work environment. These are not just kind of like, oh my gosh, I don't believe this thing happened. These are normal things. Not normal in the sense that it's okay, but our society has it been created with systemic racism. And so it's in everything. And to do something about it requires doing something about it, right? And so how are we normalizing racism in our workplace? We do it in our hiring. We fail to hire for a DEI competency. And I'm not just talking about hiring people of color, but how many people here have had an interview where they, you were asked, um, can you tell me about how you successfully worked across racial and cultural differences? Are we hiring for DEI competency? Are we advancing people to managerial levels without getting a sense that they know how to manage people well who are different than them? Do we have any accountability in terms of having an inclusive work environment? Do we have any ability to talk about racism in a way that isn't riddled with fragility? Do we have people of color at high levels of leadership? Do we have that representation there? Are there any norms established in our company handbook or in our HR policies about managing racial conflict? Do we have norms there? When someone comes to us and says, hey, I'm experiencing discrimination, we have this bias for intention. Well, do they mean that? Okay, what about how it made me feel? What about the impact that that's had on my career? Do they mean that? Can you prove to me this discrimination? What is the recourse for someone who's experienced racial discrimination in HR? Actually, what is that? So what are ways that we normalize racism at work? And this is when I go from the intention to the impact. And I saw in the comments here of someone, as I'm trying to have a conversation about the hair touching, you know, someone in the comment is saying, well, we, we want volume in our hair. We're jealous of your hair, right? What do your intentions around this matter, right? Is it more important that you want to talk to me about my hair than the fact that it hurts? If you and I are walking with weight and that like, you know, I'm carrying something heavy, I drop this heavy thing on your foot, your toe breaks. Should we just stand here and talk about how I didn't mean to drop it? How there are all these things that I was juggling and it just slipped out of my hand and I'm a good person and I would never drop, you know, toe, uh, uh, I would never hurt someone, right? Should we talk about the intention, or should we figure out how to get you to the hospital because your toe is broken? Let's think about the impact, because when we don't focus on the impact, we erase ourselves. We erase, we erase the, folks, the people who are experiencing that discrimination. So in all of this, in thinking about how difficult work can be sometimes for folks of color, we use this sense of authenticity. We want people to bring their, bring their authentic selves to work. We want them to bring their full stuff to work. And yes, that's great because it can expose this idea of we want people to bring their authentic selves. It exposes the reality that there are some individuals that are experiencing work differently, that there are some people who struggle to be authentic. So that's what that can help, right? Talking about authenticity, 
provides this safe language to share these experiences of marginalization and underrepresentation at work. I'm seeing in the chat, I'm talking about race. There are folks who are bringing in things about parents and about women and about abilities and all of that coming into the chat, like we are in this together in terms of that marginalization, in terms of that intersectionality. And so having authentic workplaces allows us to grow that people power, right? It shows that we want to have happier and more productive workplaces for people to be themselves. And so this goal around authenticity is laudable but maybe it can create change in our organizations, but it can't transform our organizations, right? We can't expect individual people to just be more authentic to then create structural change, all the structures that we just spoke about. And so then that can create an authenticity gap in many instances. Who are we? Who do we say we are? What does our brand say we are? What is the impact that we want to have? And what are we actually doing internally? Nike had this phenomenal campaign, Dream Crazy, right? They wanted to affirm women and girls in sports. And so Alicia Mont Montano was like, cool, you want me to dream crazy? Let's talk about dream maternity. You talk about supporting women and girls in sports, but I have no sponsorship money from you during my maternity leave, how are you actually supporting women if you don't support pregnant mothers? What are the internal things that are happening within your company to make that shift? And yes, Nike did make shifts after Alicia Montano had to go hugely public with the New York Times op-ed and a huge campaign to make that shift. You know, if you don't have that type of clout, how are you making shifts within your own company? So think about what are you doing to uphold a racist work environment? What are ways that you are being complicit in the inaction around making a change, right? What ways are you affirming policies, not interviewing people with the right questions, not knowing how to manage racial conflict as a manager? What are you doing that upholds this environment? Because when you understand what you're doing, then you have the guide of how you going to change, how we can reach this vision for authenticity that we all just share together. And so what are some of those solutions? Let's go into that. We drink some water too. So as we think about solutions, let's understand that we can shift. There are things that we used to say and do and then we learned this thing, and so now we do that. For example, Jody Ann spoke at length about how talking about women of color here can be really microaggressive. And so I used to always compliment my coworkers' curly hair, you know, as an example. I know that can be a little problematic, um, so I'm not, now I'm not going to do that anymore. And then maybe I'll question why is it that I want to comp uh, uh, make a comment about a woman's appearance in a professional environment. Is it possible to just get on a Zoom and not make a hair comment, you know? So we can shift, for example. I used to say, you know, there's a lot of homeless people in this area. And then I learned about this people first approach where you wanna talk about people as people first, not defined by their condition. And so now I say, you know, people experiencing homelessness. There's a language shift. I used to just do webinars and stuff without really thinking about death accessibility. But then I learned about how virtual programming don't really have a lot of options for people who can't hear. And so now in my work, I offer ASL interpretation and captioning, like there's captioning today. And so as we're having that, this conversation, I think the best solution, right, from taking these microaggressions into creating more authentic places of belonging is to understand what are these things that I used to do? What am I learning now or getting exposed to now that's in conflict with what I used to do? And so what can I do now? We can always make these shifts if we take the time. And so what are some individual actions? 
a lot of times people think about allyship first, but there are different types of allies. There are lazy allies, secret allies, performative allies, and actual allies. Lazy allies, they believe something, but they don't do anything. Secret allies believe the thing, but only share what they believe in private. Opportunistic allies speak, that about, speak out about things when there's some gain. Performative allies virtue signal, but that signaling doesn't sustain over time. And so true allies have this alignment between what I believe, what I'm learning, what I'm doing, and what I'm willing to risk. So even Roxanne Gay blows this up. She talks about Black people. She says this in one of her articles. She wrote, Black people do not need allies. And I just want to read that quotation from her. If anyone wants to find the article, it's from 2016. Um, she writes about Ferguson, um, and I think the article is called The Mattering of Black Lives or something like that. But she says, Black people do not need allies. We need people to stand up and take on problems born of oppression as their own without removing or distance, which allyship can feel like that. We need people to do this even if they cannot fully understand what it's like to be oppressed for their race or ethnicity, gender, sexuality, ability, class, religion, or other market of identity. And here's the kicker. She says, we need people to use common sense to figure out how to participate in social justice. What are your actions? What are you going to do? Oh, thank you, Lisa, for putting the article in the chat. It's from Mary Claire. Then we need to think about institutional actions. How can we use common sense institutionally? Have a plan for execution. What are my duties and responsibilities? What is within my sphere of influence? What do I know about the barriers that Black people might face? And we can use Black people as a proxy for people of color, for women, et cetera. What are the barriers this community faces? What can I do based on my duties and responsibilities to unlock these barriers? And then how can I stay accountable? This is what the work looks like, people. Across every institution, every role that you have, you have the power to make a change. You can take all of this stuff that folks of color experience and that work with the microaggressions, and you can be responsible for the shift. What's in my realm of influence? What do I know people have barriers with? How can I unlock those barriers? If you're a manager and you understand that people of color have really, really bad experience sometimes with their managers, how can you then think about your role as a manager differently? How do you stay accountable to that? How does the institution keep you accountable to being a good manager for people who are different than you? What is your plan? And that's what I'll leave you with, right? When we think about what we can do we can do something, and it's the doing part that matters way more than what we say, matters way more than what we actually believe. How can we create authentic workplaces, strong places of belonging through our actions and not our words? And that's it. Thank you so much, Jodian. Um, this has been really uh, enjoyable and instructive and thought provoking, and we really appreciate you bringing your perspective and your expertise. And thank you all so much to uh, the many of you who shared reflections and resources and experiences in the chat. Um, I'm, you know, it was great to see so many of you relating to one another and, and sharing things from your work. So I know that, uh, Many of you are probably hoping to claim a CE credit from today's presentation, and if you are, uh, here is the URL that will take you to the evaluation where you can start that process. Uh, when you complete the evaluation, you'll get the MLA CE code and the directions for redeeming it on MedLib Ed. Um, and you can all be on the lookout, as I mentioned in the chat, you can all be on the lookout for an email from me in about a week. 
um, with this link and the link to the recording. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining us today and thank you again for sharing with us today. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me via email with any questions. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Judy Ann. Thank you.